Okay, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending on where you're joining this webinar. Uh, welcome to LMU's special lecture series on international business and regional studies. My name is Yong Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management and director of Center for Asian Business and also the Center for International Business Education of Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. Today's program is funded by DK Kim Foundation, our gracious benefactor of the Center for Asian Business for past six years, and also sponsored by the LMU Center for International Business Education. The Center for Asian Business was established in 1995 to promote better understanding between the US and Asian countries through multiple channels, including international business courses, faculty research grants, student scholarships, special lectures and movie screenings. LMU is among the 16 universities in the country who received very prestigious cyber grants awards from the US Department of Education. The LMU side serves as regional as well as national resources to our students, faculty, and business practitioners through international business and area study education, and also the foreign language training and research capacities. We have a great program today. Dr. Sangwon Song will discuss a very timely and important topic as the U.S. presidential election date is quickly approaching. The U.S. and China are the two largest economies in the world. It is critical for these two countries to maintain a good relationship to keep the global economy moving forward. Unfortunately, ongoing trade disputes and national security concerns have continued to escalate political as well as commercial tensions between these two countries. The former U.S. Trump, uh, President Trump tried to resolve these conflicts through multiple protectionist measures against China. The Biden administration has not changed much its hardline approach to China. For example, ByteDance, the parent company of TikTok, was ordered to divest it to a non-Chinese company by mid-January 2025. <laughs> if it fails to do it, the TikTok would be effectively banned in the US. Some pundits even talk about a new Cold War between the US and China. Given these backgrounds, I'm sure today's lecture would be enlightening to better understand how the upcoming presidential election will affect the future prospect of the US-China relationship. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce our webinar speaker, Dr. Sangwon Song. Dr. Song is an LMU professor of finance and economics, and he's an internationally known economist. Dr. Song is president of SS Economics, an economic consulting company focused on the US economy, international trade in the Pacific Rim and technology, including AI. Dr. Son was president and CEO of Hami Financial Corporation, a commercial bank in Los Angeles. Before joining Hami Bank in 2020, uh, 2005, Dr. Son was an executive vice president and chief economic officer at Wells Fargo Bank. Prior to Wells Fargo, Dr. Son was a senior economist on the President's Council of Economic Advisors at the White House. He was responsible for economic and legislative matters pertaining to the Federal Reserve and financial markets. He was also vice chairman of the board at a retailer Forever 21. Dr. Song also serves as a commissioner for LACERS, Los Angeles City Employee Retirement System, and chair of the investment committee managing $17 billion in assets. The Wall Street Journal in year 2006 featured the story naming Dr. Son as the most accurate economist in the US. Dr. Son, thank you so much for joining the webinar today. Now you can speak to our audience for about 30 minutes. And after your presentation, I'll ask you a few questions first before we take questions sure. from the audience. So Dr. Song, now floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Peck. And uh, I have a number of slides that I'd like, I'd like to go through uh, fairly quickly. And can you see the slides? Yes, we can see your slide. Okay. I wanna talk about the US economic situation 
including the election. And then I will move on to uh, China. Hopefully you will get enough information presentation to ask some uh, good questions. I'm going to go through these uh, slides uh, pretty fast. So uh, you might miss some of, some of them and that's okay. Inflation, uh, that's one good news we have. The Federal Reserve has a 2% target and we're not quite there, but uh, we are getting pretty close to it. And that's one of the reasons why, as you know, the central bank, they decided to cut the interest rates today. You see the inflation rate back in uh, right here, June of 2022 was a 9.1%. Today it's between two and a half to three percent, even though we're not quite at two percent target, you can see we made uh, tremendous progress. And that's one of the reasons why Chairman Powell decided to cut the interest rate. You see the progress that we have made. Energy, food, core goods like appliances and furniture, uh, services, uh, shelter, and uh, let's just look at them. If you look at the kind of a purple portion, that is uh, energy. This portion is the food. And then this portion here, that is goods such as appliances and furniture. You see, they've all come down quite a bit. But we do have some challenges like services, uh, which is mostly labor, and then uh, housing. And so the price of housing has not come down. In fact, uh, that is a major source of inflation that we have uh, uh, today. You can kind of see the green line that you see, that is the uh, average hourly earnings, and then the dark line that is a consumer price index. And right now, actually, Earnings are running ahead of uh, consumer price index. Our buying power is going up, at least for now. And so that's another good news on the inflation front. But of course, uh, when you compare inflation uh, back to 2019, the picture does not look very good. A carton of eggs back in 2019 was $1.20. Today, $2.72. A loaf of bread was a dollar twenty-eight today, dollar ninety-seven. Cookies three fifty now five oh two. I can go on and on and on, but you can kind of see why. Well, even though in the short run we have made a good progress, we're happy about that. But over time, we still have uh, significant price increases, and then people are having problem making ends meet. If you look at the cost of living since two thousand seventy-four. Things doesn't look quite as optimistic. You can see in 1974, a new house cost uh, $35,000. Can you imagine $35,000? Average income was about $14,000 per year. A new car cost uh, less than $4,000. Well, those days are long gone, but we still have uh, some good news to report. But it also depends on where you live. Suppose uh, your cost of living is $1,000 right now. If you were to live in Washington, D.C., the buying power of that $1,000 is only eight seventy-two. Go to Massachusetts, nine oh six, And California, eight seventy-five. If you go to Arkansas, eleven thirty-five. Clearly, if you go to some of these uh, states, especially in the South, such as uh, Alabama, Mississippi, and Arkansas, prices are much lower you have a more buying, more buying power. Whereas when you go to Washington, D.C., California, that's a different story. So we have a good news on the inflation front. But what about jobs? And this is one of the concerns we have. Maybe the Federal Reserve, uh, the central bank, they've done a too good a job. You can see how rapidly they've raised interest rates. 2004, 1994, 1998, 2022, you see, this is one of the fastest increases in the interest rate in the central bank we have seen during the post-war period. Some people say this is one of the reasons why we have uh, really brought down the inflation rate, but maybe this is one of the reasons why we have to worry about now a recession. I hope not, but uh, people are beginning to worry. 
are we going to have a recession? You see the job market. We are creating fewer and fewer jobs. Jobless rate is going up. And we also see where the jobs are coming from. These are primarily four areas. Healthcare, right here. Hospitality, restaurants and bars. And the government. And there's one more, construction. And you can kind of see why we are getting more and more jobs in construction. And you can see, according to the Congressional Budget Office, since the pandemic, we have added about 9 million people from overseas. Some are documented and many are undocumented. You see kind of this yellowish portion of the bar. Those are so-called the undocumented immigration. And uh, again, Congressional Budget Office says that about 9 million people came since the uh, pandemic. And uh, where do they go? You can kind of see this chart. A lot of them go to construction, maids and housekeeping services, cooks, janitorial services, and on and on and on. So you see many of them, many of them, they go to construction. And then that's one of the reasons why we have seen the construction employment going up. So what about the economy? Are we going to have a soft landing, hard landing? And uh, well, Chairman Powell, as I said, some people say he has done maybe too good a job. Inflation is uh, down to around two and a half to three percent. But do we have to worry about a recession? You see, interest rates have gone up pretty sharply, and then we're expecting the rates to come down. But many people are saying that we need to bring down the interest rate at a faster pace to make sure that we do not go into a recession. Here you see a historical data. Every time the Federal Reserve, they begin to raise interest rates. In about 60% of the cases, the economy went into a recession. Again, this is the case where they raised interest rates too high, too, too fast. In 40% of the cases, they did not. Well, so people are saying, are we going to have a recession or are we not? We will have to wait and see. I talk about what is called uh, a rolling recession. You can see at the last uh, Davos Forum in Switzerland, uh, they actually uh, show this uh, in one of the presentations. I wasn't there, but it says a, a rolling recession is in progress. Dr. Sun once on uh, Professor Allen University, and so this is what they said. Uh, I've been promoting what is known as a rolling recession. Rolling recession essentially is uh, there are many sectors of the economy, but you take turns. Housing goes down first, manufacturing next, and then eventually consumer spending. And so you take turns. And uh, by the end of uh, the period, most sectors of the economy, they end up going into a recession. This way you distribute pain. You do not all go into a recession at the same time, but you take turns. And so that's why you distribute pain. I happen to believe that uh, we will have a soft landing, uh, no recession. One of the questions I guess people are asking is, uh, what impact will the election have? Vice President Harris and then former President Biden. Here is a Harris's economic plan. She wants to spend money on housing, paid leave, health care, child care, and uh, other extended, uh, extending, expiring uh, tax cuts and et cetera. So she's saying that I want to spend about $6 trillion. How is she going to pay for that? Well, she wants to quadruple buybacks and prescription drugs, international corporate taxes, capital gains, higher tax rates for rich people, and uh, higher corporate tax rates. And then that is supposed to raise about five or about, you know, close to $5 trillion. So you spend six and you collect about roughly one half to $5 trillion. And then the difference would be obviously higher deficits. That's what she said. If you look at the President Trump or former President Trump, and uh, this is where he wants to spend the money. He wants to lower the corporate tax rate and no tax on tips over time or social security benefits. And then he wants to uh, extend the 
expiring tax cuts uh, that he put in place uh, back in uh, you know 2006 and 2007. And that's going to cost us about $7 trillion. How is he going to pay for that? Well, he wants to repeal clean energy subsidies. That's one. But a major portion of uh, his uh, spending program would be paid for by the tariffs. And this is where China comes in. And we will get into that in a minute. So now he hasn't really fully explained uh, how he's going to pay for all that. And I'm sure he will come up with more details, but you can kind of see uh, in this case, uh, spending exceeds uh, the, the tax collection that he's talking about. And clearly, if you look at the uh, tax gains or losses uh, under the Harris plan, people at the uh, high end of the income spectrum, they are going to be losing. Under the Trump tax plan, people at the higher end of the income spectrum, they are going to be gaining. But in the United States, it's not just the White House that matters, but Congress. It all depends what happens to the House and the Senate. Here we have a, you know, at least three scenarios, and then we can have more. Trump wins, and then both House and Senate, they go Republican. Harris wins, and then uh, Democratic Senate, and then Republican uh, House and Republican Senate. Uh, Trump wins, and then you can see we can talk about many different scenarios. So even though we may have a new president in Washington, it all depends uh, how Congress, they react to that. And depending upon who controls the Senate and the House, it's going to make a lot of difference. And so we'll talk about that. Let's talk about China. China is very important, and then China is the second largest economy, and the U.S. is the largest economy. So we have uh, two economies, United States and China. How do they interact? And so let's talk about China. If you look at China, China's economic growth rate, as you can see, has come uh, has uh, uh, come down quite a bit to about five percent. Used to be, as you can see back here about 15% per year, 15% per year, but we are down to about 5% per year. And then pretty, that's a you know, pretty significant decrease. And uh, if you look at the next slide, you know, China has uh, lots of economic problems. Uh, every nation has problems. Uh, we, in the United States, uh, we have a problem, but China have a bunch of them as well. The nation as a whole has uh, too much debt, real estate in doldrum. They depend on exports. Too heavily. They're trying to drum up consumer spending, but that is not going very well. And then, of course, the role of the government is uh, very high. And so those are some of the problems. As I pointed out, China has a lot of debt, households, non-financial corporations, the central government, and the local government. If you look at the blue portion of the bar, that is a uh, so-called non-financial corporations, and uh, much of that is related to real estate. China has uh, borrowed a lot of money to fund real estate, and then that is uh, a major source of economic growth in the past, but uh, has been a major source of economic growth, but also, as you can see, that is a major source of uh, debt. They have uh, too many real estate projects incurring too much debt. In the past, uh, a major source of economic growth has been real estate, and that is no more. And that's one of the reasons why China's economic growth is slowing down. Also, China depends uh, heavily on exports. As you can see, these are Chinese exports in dollars and cents. During the pandemic and then thereafter, exports went up sharply. And since then, they have maintained their level of exports. And uh, exports are very important for China, as we all know. One of the reasons why exports are strong is because uh, Chinese uh, domestic demand is weak. In a minute, I'll talk about Chinese consumption. But Chinese consumption is weak. As a result, they cannot consume what they produce. As a result, they're emphasizing exports, and more and more exports are beginning to uh, be a source of economic growth. 
if you look at consumption as a percent of GDP in China, like for example, in the United States, it's about 83%, but in China, it's only 53%. So consumer spending is a lion's share of uh, economic growth in the United States, but in China, that is not the case. Chinese consumers are not feeling very good. Chinese government wants consumers to spend. They want the consumers to be a major source of economic growth. But as you can see, consumer confidence has come down quite a bit. And a main reason for this uh, plunge in consumer confidence is uh, real estate. Real estate is so important in China. When the price of real estate tumbles like it has in China, you can see the Chinese you know, population who own real estate homeowners, they feel pretty bad. And then so they don't spend money. And so that's what's happening in China. You can kind of see the weak consumption. We are breaking down Chinese GDP into consumption, capital spending, net exports, and et cetera. But if you look at the black portion of the bar, that is a Chinese consumption and the consumption is uh, not doing very well at all. If you look at the uh, the government sector, as I pointed out, the Chinese share of the government in the GDP is very high. You can see in the United States, it's only 18%. In China, 38%. So the role of the government is a very, very important. But the Chinese government is not going to stimulate the economy right now to any significant degree. That's not their major emphasis. Their major emphasis is uh, they want to become a technological classes. And uh, they want to become technologically independent, and they don't want to get away. From, they want to get away from what they call Western meddling. Their top priorities are electric vehicles, and semiconductors, and then renewable energy. So right now, the factories are churning out goods. Supply exceeds demand, and so what are they doing? Well, they're not consuming at home, so they are exporting them, and so. Europeans are alarmed, America is a concern. And then so some people are saying that, will China become another Japan? Little or no economic growth, maybe have a deflation. They're experiencing a sort of a deflation in China. So that's why people say, will China become another Japan? Again, as I pointed out, well, there's a election going on, election coming up in the United States fairly soon. And then so one of the questions is, uh, are we going to have another trade war with China? And uh, the main issue is really tariff between the U.S. and then China. As a result of the election, we will see a clearer, clearer thick picture of uh, what the United States will do in terms of a tariff. Uh, you know, we have so-called critical imports from uh, antibiotics to uh, steel. We have so-called infant industries, such as electric vehicles. Uh, if we raise uh, tariffs on Chinese imports, of course, uh, that doesn't mean that production comes to the U.S. They go to other countries, Vietnam, Indonesia, Korea, and elsewhere. So if we raise tariff on Chinese goods, simply imports will come from other countries. How about the revenue? Who's going to pay for that tariff? And that's another issue that we have to you know, talk about. So the question is, uh, really, why are we raising tariff on China? And uh, will it work? One of the main issues is uh, playing fair. Many people in America think that China does not play fair. We want fair trade. And one of the reasons why we want to raise tariff on China, they say, Americans say, is because uh, we want the China to play fair. We will have to wait and see. Well, uh, things are not going to be rosy between the United States and China. And as uh, you know, Professor Peck mentioned, uh, we have a lot of problems between the United States and China, including uh, TikTok. But let's not forget the fact that China is the second largest economy in the world, and we are the largest. We are joined at the hip, and so we cannot separate the two together. China is a large consumer base, so uh, our businesses, we need uh, Chinese consumers. And also, many Chinese uh, industries are inefficient, which means that American industries have an opportunity 
to go into China and then uh, hopefully uh, do well, not only increasing production, but also selling more in China. So we have a, you know, hopefully we will have a win-win situation, but that is not what we have right now. So I will uh, stop here right now and uh, 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 start entertaining some uh, questions. Uh, Okay, Dr. Song, thank you so much um, for your very informative and interesting um, lecture. Um, as I said, it's very timely and um, the critical issue, uh, particularly that, you know, given that uh, our president election is uh, just around the corner. So before we take uh, some questions uh, from the audience. Uh, I'd like to ask a couple of questions. I'd like to begin with actually, because at the beginning you mentioned the uh, uh, Federal Reserve uh, lowered the key interest rates uh, today by half percentage point. And you mentioned that the you know, uh, Fed did a great job in curbing in, uh, inflation. But at the same time, we've seen the continued uh, increase uh, on employment and job market is getting sour. So do you think this is enough to revitalize job market in the U.S.? Uh, no, uh, as uh, the central bank pointed out, this is just the beginning. Uh, they will be cutting rates again. Uh, they talked about cutting as much as uh, half a percentage point or more by the end of the year, and then uh, more beyond that. So I think this is just the beginning. Uh -huh. uh, clearly the central bank is worried. Uh, have they overdone it? I personally think that they have probably raised interest rates too high too fast, and then they sure. should have cutting the interest rate earlier, but yeah. okay. well, better now than uh, you know never. And so we will have to wait and see, but again, uh, it's to me pretty clear that they raise interest rates too high, too fast, and then that's why economy is uh, slowing. But yeah. I, I don't think we will get into a recession, though. Okay. What about uh, you introduced a very interesting term, the rolling recession? Uh, is that still a possibility of a rolling recession, even though it is not a real, you know, the serious recession? Uh, yes, I coined the term uh, rolling recession. Uh, again, that's uh, become. Uh, you know, uh, that's being used so widespread, as I pointed out. They even uh, used it at the uh, Davos Forum in Switzerland back in January. Right. And then so uh, I've gotten uh, many articles uh, about the rolling recession. But I think we are in a rolling recession. We are at the tail end of a uh, rolling recession. As I mentioned, uh, it began with uh, housing when interest rates went up. Mm -hmm. uh, but now you can see the consumer spending is slowing down. And right. that is the tail end. Uh, you know, one thing I'm concerned about is uh, consumer spending. And that is, uh, you know, about 70, 75% of uh, the GDP. So right. if a consumer, uh, they stop spending money, then mm -hmm. we got problem. Uh, there are some indications that the consumers are worried. Uh, uh, they don't have the money. Their credit card, their balances are very high. Their delinquency rate on credit cards are going up. So uh, there are some worrisome signs. And so that could lead to an economic recession. But again, I'm hoping that the central bank will cut the interest rate more aggressively. And then when they do that, uh, hopefully we will see uh, a soft landing as opposed to a hard landing, a recession. Okay, good. In 2001, Bloomberg News actually they selected you as one of the five most accurate economic forecasters in the US. How do you expect the economic prospect of the Asian economy for a year 2025? Particularly, you know, China, Japan, and Korea, these are the three major trading partners for the US and as well as the state of California. You mentioned about uh, China, but can you comment on Japan and Korea? Because recently there has been a real, real problem with the Japanese yen and continued the devaluation of yen, even though it kind of subsided. So what is your prediction about the economy in Japan and Korea? Uh, the Japanese economy has gone through a quarter of a century, 25 years of, uh, you know, essentially no growth and uh, zero inflation. 
as a result, uh, while the U.S. was uh, raising the interest rates, the Bank of Japan kept interest rate as zero or uh, negative. Mm -hmm. The good news is that the Japanese economy is beginning to come back a little bit, not a lot, beginning to come back. And then uh, the Bank of Japan has uh, begun to actually hike the interest rates a little bit, not a whole lot. So we have a, an interesting situation where all the central banks around the world, uh, European Central Bank, uh, Bank of Canada, the Federal Reserve uh, are cutting the interest rates, but the Bank of Japan is uh, beginning to raise interest rates. And uh, that's an indication that the economies are beginning to have some steam. And then also uh, inflation rate is uh, rebounding somewhat. So, you know, what is the reason why the Japanese economy is coming back? Well, first of all, you know, they have a lot of liquidity. Central bank has been pouring liquidity into the into the economy for quite some time, so uh, that is uh, one of the reasons. And then, you know, borrowing money in Japan is uh, very easy because uh, there's so much liquidity; the interest rate is zero, or in some cases, uh, negative. Also, uh, Japan has been able to export a lot. We know the Japanese yen has uh, depreciated dramatically, and uh, I mean, you know, at one point, uh, one dollar went to 165 Japanese yen. And not long time ago, it was like you know 110 yen to a dollar. Yeah. So as a result of uh, the Japanese yen depreciation, we have seen uh, Japanese exports rising as well. Mm -hmm. So between exports and low interest rates, uh, we have seen the Japanese economy uh, doing better, and hopefully they will do better. As I mentioned, Chinese economy has some problems, and then maybe the problem is uh, going from Japan to China. Uh, many people are concerned that uh, China will go through what Japan has gone through, right. a deflation, low economic growth. And uh, we will have to see how the Chinese economy does. Uh, so we will have to wait and see. So the China's economic outlook does not look very good. If you look at Korea, uh, the Korean economy is, uh, you know, doing okay. Not, you know, tremendously well, but... Uh, the Korean economy is uh, showing meaningful economic growth. Uh, so they're not going to have to cut the interest rates dramatically. So the Central Bank of Korea, the Bank of Korea, I think will cut the interest rates, but you know, but not not you know by a large amount. So in short, I'm saying that US will, US will avoid a recession. Uh, Japan will start growing again, uh, not tremendously, but uh, slowly and gradually. The China will be in a, in, in doldrums uh, for quite some time to come, mm -hmm. uh, so that's kind of what I'm uh, looking at. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question I have is related to the, some of the comments you already mentioned. Um, I think the Biden administration has continued with much of the Trump administration's hardline approach to China. As we saw its recent imposition of 100% tariff on EVs from China and passage of IRA and CHIPS Act. Personally, I don't think this stance will change much. Whoever is elected as our next president, um, what are the main differences we will see in handling China depending upon the outcome of the election? Well, it seems uh, <clears throat> China is the one area that the two candidates agree on. And uh, there aren't really huge differences between the two. Okay. Uh, we are going to see probably higher tariffs, no matter uh, you know who the next president is. Mm -hmm. uh, even though uh, Vice President Harris, he has not talked about some specific numbers, it's uh, pretty clear that, uh, if anything, tariffs on Chinese goods will be going up. Right. Uh, former President Trump has talked about raising tariffs on Chinese goods up to 60%, 60 percent, six zero. And right. that's a quite a bit. And then so uh, obviously, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of importers are alarmed. Uh, well, it depends also not only the level of tariff that matters, but will it be applied to every single good? Will it be across the board? Or are we going to say, well, you know, some of the some of the goods are going to be exempt uh -huh. and the other goods will probably pay uh, higher tariffs. Right. You know, that matters because uh, let me just give you some examples. Uh, you know, we all use antibiotics. The 90% of the raw materials that we need to manufacture antibiotics, they come from China and India. 
So are we going to increase uh, tariff on you know antibiotics by 90 percent? And you know, you and I will have to pay for that because we all use antibiotics, and so that may not be such a good idea. Right. On the other hand, uh, you know, electric vehicles. Uh, we have now decided to raise uh, tariff on electric vehicles by uh, more than 100 percent, and uh, Europeans have raised uh, tariff on electric vehicles, EVs, uh, you know, as well. So some would argue that. That may not be such a bad idea because uh, China is uh, subsidizing their electric vehicles heavily. Mm -hmm. And then also economists uh, talk about what is known as an, known as an infant industry argument. Electric vehicles, vehicles are, you know, that's an infant industry. Therefore, until they can get back on their feet, maybe we should uh, levy tariff on foreign competition and then let them compete. So, you know, maybe that's that 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 might be a. Uh, uh, you know, not a bad idea. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I talked about antibiotics, but, uh, you know, some specialty steel. You know, we talk about living uh, tariff on steel, and we do right now. But, you know, you can't simply say steel in generic terms. There are many different kinds of steel. For example, many of us uh, have uh, electric ceiling fans in our houses. To make electric ceiling fan, you need some specialty steel. And a lot of that is coming from China. And we don't have much of that in the United States. So if we raise tariff on steel, 20, 30, 40, 60%, including steel on the manufacture of an electric ceiling fan, you can see the price of an electric ceiling fan could go up quite a bit, double, maybe triple. And then so what I'm saying is that we can talk about tariff and we're gonna have tariff on Chinese goods. Uh, that uh, is pretty clear. But I think we need to decide, you know, what type of a goods, antibiotics, ceiling fan steel, electric vehicles. So I think, you know, what type of a tariff we have on which goods, uh, that to me is, uh, you know, very important. But again, on balance, we are going to see higher tariffs. Well, it's very interesting because you mentioned that infant industry. I thought the infant industry is uh, typically advanced by the developing countries. Uh, but you mentioned that actually the EV is an infant industry um, for the, In the United States. Yeah, it, I mean, actually, oh. it, yeah, it's uh, Elon Musk is the one who taught how to make electric vehicles in China. But of course, you know, right now, China, they are dominating it. Okay, uh, I think that I'm gonna just limit my questions here because I see a lot of questions posted from uh, the audience. So at this point now, I'd like to ask my colleague, uh, Ms. Nola Wanta, the Senior Director of Business Development and Strategy to moderate and lead the Q&A session. Nola, would you please Wonderful. take some questions from the audience? For absolutely, that? absolutely. Thank you. thank you. And thank you everyone for submitting your questions. We were up to 10 questions, so we're gonna try and get through as many of them as possible. And my apologies if, um, and actually for those of you, as you read through the Q&A, within the Q&A box, if you see a question that you absolutely think should be asked, feel free to click the thumbs up and that'll move up some of the questions so um, we can address as many of um, the questions as possible. I'll go ahead and start from the top. Um, thank you, Anatoly, for submitting this question first and being the first one, so we'll address that one first. Um, so, for Professor Son, uh, could you comment on the U.S. federal debt level in comparison to one or two of our counterparts worldwide? You see any opportunities to reduce this debt level under the next administration, and what are some of the implications? So I assume you're talking about the the federal debt. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, answer to that is uh, no. As you can see, uh, you know the I I showed you the charts. Whether it's uh, Vice President Harris or uh, former President, uh, you know Trump, they want to spend money, and. Uh, They've identified some revenue sources, but you know some of them are iffy. And uh, again, according to the data that we have today, again as I pointed out, uh, former President Trump uh, will come up with uh, more data on how to cover the deficits. But uh, right now we're talking about trillions of dollars of uh, more debt. And uh, so I think uh, we are going to see more debt as far as eyes can see right now 
unless uh, they come up with some uh, new data. Let me just uh, make one more point. It took this nation 200 years from uh, the founding of this nation to 18, uh, 19, uh, in, uh, 1986, uh, roughly, uh, 200 years to pile up is the first $1 trillion in national debt, 200 years. And now this year, the Congressional Budget Office thinks that we are going to be adding $1.9 trillion in this year alone. So you can kind of, kind of see how rapidly we are piling up our national debt. And so there are some concerns. There are some concerns is that you know someone has to buy the debt. And uh, we are beginning to see some reluctance in the debt market. Many buyers are saying that, you know what? You know, that's just uh, too much debt. And not only uh, we see some concerns from the US buyers, but also from international buyers, for example, China. They've been in the past a major source of uh, US debt. And now they have been decreasing it. They are saying, we have too much of that. And I see you guys are increasing debt higher and higher. So we are going to be cautious and that uh, we are cutting back the holdings of US government debt. So unfortunately, our national debt will go up. To me, the question is uh, how rapidly will it go up? And so at some point, I wouldn't be surprised if the US government has uh, some trouble selling the debt. When you try to sell, you know, two trillion dollars in to a trillion dollars in national debt every year. And who knows, next year it could be two and a half trillion. You, you should expect some fireworks. Yeah, and, and so I'm gonna go to William's question um, in terms of you know just staying on the debt um, topic. What steps do you believe the central banks should take in response to the federal debt level? Well, there really isn't much they can do about it because uh, it is not their purview. And uh, the central bank's responsibility is uh, really focused on two things, what is known as a dual mandate, stable employment, and then, of course, uh, price stability, which is inflation. So they cannot concern themselves with uh, the national debt. They have to focus on inflation. If inflation rate goes up as a result of uh, you know huge huge amounts of government debt, they're going to have to raise in the interest rates. And when they raise interest rates, the economy could go into a recession or certainly could slow. And then so uh, the the focus of uh, the Federal Reserve is not national debt. That's not their job. Their focus is uh, inflation. Now the inflation rate could go up indirectly because of a large national debt. And so. We could see a situation going forward. That was uh, the, the Uncle Sam, the U.S. Treasury, they end up issuing a lot of debt. And as a result, uh, inflation rate goes up. When the inflation rate goes up, as a result, the central bank could raise the interest rate. And when interest rates goes up, that could slow economic growth or push the economy into a recession. And as a result, uh, you know, we might see, uh, you know, a bad economic situation. So. That that's that's how things work. Great, thank you for that. A, a lot of our questions um, here seem to um, deal with China, so I'm gonna um, jump to Jung Hoon's uh, question. The first, he says a comment to you. Thank you for sharing your insight, Dr. Sun. You mentioned that certain Chinese industries or operations are less efficient compared to those in the U.S., which creates potential opportunities for American firms. Um, you can't recall the exact term you used, but could you please elaborate on what you mean by inefficiencies in Chinese industries and how these differences might present opportunities for U.S. companies? And what are some of the examples of those industries that you that you mentioned? Well, uh, uh, clearly, uh, semiconductor chip, that is one. Uh, NVIDIA is obviously a very good example. And uh, but here, of course, uh, we don't want NVIDIA to sell chips into uh, China, right? And then so, uh, but aside from NVIDIA, clearly American design of our chips is uh, pretty far advanced. We are better than anyone else around the world. So, uh, you know, maybe NVIDIA chips, uh, you know, cannot be sold in China, but there could be other types of chips that we can sell in China because we are much better. We don't manufacture them, but we are very good at designing it. Uh, so that's uh, one example. You know, biotechnology, that's another one. 
in Southern California, we have uh, you know very strong biotechnology, and so we ought to be able to sell our knowledge and uh, even products related to biotechnology uh, to China. So I think the list can go on and on and on. So uh, that's why I said uh, U.S. and China we are really joined at the hips, and so. You know, we can talk about uh, NVIDIA chips and we can talk about electric vehicles. You know, there are some problems out there, but there are far more. In fact, that there are, you know, many, 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 many more industries and areas where we can cooperate. And so that's why I use the term uh, we are joined at the hip. And so we need to cooperate and then we need to uh, work together. Great. And um, you mentioned EVs. So Jacob asked, you talked about raising tariffs earlier. How do you think the rising tariffs on EVs and components from China will impact domestic green subsidies and how will this impact the economy? 100% tariff on EV, uh, that clearly will uh, prevent the Chinese uh, EVs uh, uh, you know, from coming into the US. And uh, earlier, the Chinese EV, for example, BYD, uh, they were going to manufacture them in uh, Mexico and then try to bring them into uh, the United States. But now uh, that is not uh, possible. And so, as you know, uh, manufacturers, including Tesla, Ford, GM, uh, you know, they found out that the demand for EVs are not that strong and uh, they are running promotions and et cetera. Uh, on top of that, if we if we if we were to face a competition from China, you know that could really hurt the U.S. EV industry, uh, you know, quite a bit. And so I think we all agree that we want to encourage EVs because uh, that helps the environment, and there are you know many other uh, benefits. So to me, uh, electric vehicle they're not doing very well right now, but going forward we need to encourage them, and then that will become a major source of our transportation. So we need to encourage them, and so. I assume that that's one of the one of the reasons why we are imposing 100% tariff on EV. So, uh, again, as I said, I mean, you know, most economists, including uh, myself, uh, we're not for tariffs, but uh, in some select cases, uh, I think it can be useful. And in this case, uh, I think uh, tariff on electric vehicles from China, you know, it does make some sense. Okay, just staying on the topic of tariffs. Um, Drew asked, do you think the 60% increase on China's tariffs will lead to China making more tariff jumping investments? If so, is there a way for the U.S. to prevent an increase in Chinese companies producing in the U.S. borders? How would these affect our economy? Uh, clearly, when we raise tariff, uh, China's not going to China's not going to sit still. They are going to be uh, retaliating, and to be sure. So you know, a lot of times a uh, tariff is a tit for tat, and uh, so it's a lose lose situation, not a win win situation. And uh, so hopefully, it will not uh, uh, last very uh, long. American firms uh, which are selling, uh, I you know, I talked about biotechnology, and then you know there are some other technology products and even consumer goods that we you know, sell into China. And they are going to be suffering because uh, China will levy additional tariffs on those goods. And so uh, that's why I say it is a you know, lose, lose situation. Uh, one way that, uh, for example, you know, the Korean car manufacturers, uh, Japanese car manufacturers, uh, they've, uh, Germans too, they've built uh, many automobile assembly plants in the United States because of, uh, you know, tariff on uh, cars. And China may try to do the same, but uh, China may try to actually, you know, do it somewhat in a roundabout way. As I mentioned, uh, they could try to go to Mexico and then manufacture goods in Mexico and then sell those goods into the United States as a Mexican good. And that way you can take advantage of uh, U.S., uh, Mexico, Canada free trade. And so, you know, there are many complications, uh, but uh, I think, uh, you know, things are not going to look pretty going forward because, uh, you know, tariffs are going to go up. And then I don't think it would be that easy for Chinese firms uh, to come into the U.S. and then set up uh, factories. And then I'm sure they will try to do that. But uh, we will have to wait and see how uh, the Chinese, you know, firms respond to higher tariffs. And again, uh, I think you are correct. 
one of the things that they are going to do is uh, try to set up factories in the United States and then buy U buy U.S. Uh, you know factories and then try to expand them. And they've already done that to some extent. And then so I'm sure we will see more of that going forward. <clears throat> and so I'll, I'll round up um, one more question on China from David. Um, you mentioned the fear that China might be on the same path of economic stagnancy that Japan has been on for decades. But because China still has a largely command and control economy, aren't prospects for China's economic future even worse? than what Japan has been going through? Yeah, that, uh, I mean, you are absolutely right. And uh, China has a many, many problems. And then first of all, demographics, because of a one-child policy, uh, they just don't have enough workers. Fairly soon, the population of China will decline. And not only that, uh, you know, the, the, the China will gray faster than almost any other nation. Uh, you know, more and more senior citizens in the Chinese population. When you talk about economic growth, it takes essentially two things. Number one, you need uh, labor force bodies. And China doesn't look very good in terms of a population and uh, able bodies uh, labor force. And the other one is, of course, uh, you know, technology. And because of the trade war, uh, you know, China is going to also suffer. They need to import technology. They need to bring technology from, from other nations. But, uh, you know, they are prevented by tariffs and other uh, other uh, uh, the, the controls by United States and uh, other countries uh, to bring technology from outside world. So when you look at the Chinese economy, population is the one problem. Importing technology, that's another problem. And, uh, and then you correctly mentioned that when you talk about command and control economy, uh, that is not good. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm a free market economy. I think the market is the best way to go. But when you have a command and control economy, that is not very good. So China has a you know number of uh, problems, and as I agree, uh, the Chinese economic outlook does not look that uh, that wonderful uh, going forward. Great. So I think this may be our last question from Jack. You mentioned Harris's high taxes on the wealthy and Trump's high tariffs on China. What effect will each candidate's policies have on the job market, and how might that how might that affect our experience searching for jobs out of college? Yeah, uh, Vice President Harris talked about, uh, you know, and, well, they all talk about creating creating more jobs. And then so that uh, if you raise taxes, uh, like, you know, Vice President Harris said that she wants to do on so-called the rich and then so uh, on, uh, you know, corporations, uh, unfortunately, that could have a negative consequences for economic growth and jobs. Economics is actually a simple science if you look at it this way. It's really a choice between distribution and economic growth. If you emphasize growth, distribution suffers. If you want to emphasize the distribution, more equitable distribution, then economic growth and jobs suffer. Uh, like, you know, President Reagan, he emphasized the uh, growth as a result, distribution suffered. Uh, President Obama, he emphasized uh, distribution. So we had a more equitable distribution, but economic growth suffered. And then so I'm not saying, you know, we need both. We need uh, good distribution, good economic growth. But if you emphasize more distribution, equitable distribution, economic growth and jobs will suffer. And then we could see that going forward. Uh, on the other hand, if we had uh, President Trump, he could emphasize economic growth. When you emphasize economic growth, then uh, we might see uh, more jobs, but the distribution is not as equitable, and so that could be a problem. So, I think uh, that's how I look at how I look at it. You can have cake. You can have cake and eat it too. So, do you want distribution, or do you want economic growth? So. We try to balance the two, so we will see how that turns out. But clearly, uh, President uh, Biden, if he becomes a president again, he's going to emphasize growth and probably more jobs. And if uh, Vice President Harris becomes president, she tends to relatively emphasize more distribution, equitable distribution. So that could mean 
uh, economic growth could uh, suffer somewhat. Thank you. And I think that's all our time for the questions. So I'll hand it over to Professor Peck. Well, thank you so much, Nola, for leading the Q&A session. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. I'm sorry that we are not able to get to all the questions you posted. Uh, thanks again, Dr. Sun, for talking to LMU community as well as our external audience. I really appreciate sharing your knowledge and insight into the critical relationship between the US and China, and also the prospect of the US economy. Finally, I would like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope that you have enjoyed the program. We'll be back with another program in October. Uh, we are planning to run two programs the one uh, on the cybersecurity issue and the other one on the issue of Taiwan. In a sense, it's kind of a related topic um, in conjunction with the uh, you know, US-China uh, relationship. So uh, you might consider this as a you know, continued talk and subject um, related to the topic today. So uh, please stay safe and healthy until we see you again. Before you leave, I really appreciate it if you could complete a brief survey at the end of this webinar. Once again, thank you so much, everyone, and good night. Thank you.